Hello and welcome to another session of ICAC Live coming to you from San Francisco. Uh, in this session, we'll be talking about influenza vaccines. But before we get to that, let me introduce myself. I'm Jeffrey Fox, your moderator for these sessions. And uh, ICAC is the, um, is the ASM, that is the American Society for Microbiology's annual infectious diseases meeting, and uh, I want to remind those of you who are watching on the web and listening on the web that you can ask questions by submitting them through Twitter at hashtag ICAC or use the at ASM newsroom uh, configuration. For this session, I have two guests at the moment and possibly a third on her way, and we'll introduce her if she shows up. Uh, but for the moment, uh, to my uh, immediate left is Donna Ambrosino of Vis Vistera, a company based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and her colleague, Zachary Shriver, also of Vistera, of course. And uh, I think what we should do is uh, let, let you summarize your findings and then we'll enter, get into a discussion. We were hoping for our other guest to arrive, but uh, when she does, if she does, we'll, we'll uh, patch her into this discussion. So I think, Donna, you would like to summarize your findings, right? And, and kind of give a background that you're, you're not really working on a on an influenza vaccine as such, but it's a slightly different approach. Yes, today uh, we're presenting our data on a monoclonal antibody called Viz410. Uh, and it does have, though, uh, a vaccine um, uh, implication that we'll be glad to talk about. Uh, the focus of our presentation, though, is how we, in fact, uh, designed this monoclonal antibody and in, then uh, how we intend uh, to use it. What we're presenting today is that this monoclonal antibody sees all influenza A viruses, and we demonstrate that both in vitro, the binding as well as neutralization. But perhaps the most uh, compelling data is the fact that when we then use this monoclonal antibody in mouse models, uh, in an H1 model as well as an H3 model, uh, we're able to get 100% protection uh, in a prevention model, and we're able to get 100% uh, uh, therapy uh, in a treatment uh, model, giving the monoclonal antibody as late as 72 hours after the uh, 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 mice become ill. Uh, so this is an antibody that we have great hopes for because it's so broadly neutralizing, so avid, and has been developed in such a unique way we think holds great promise for both preventing um, um, disease, pandemic flu, uh, as well as treatment of patients who are sick with uh, pandemic flu or H5 um, or seasonal flu. Okay, uh, let, me, let me just start the question with a asking you for a bit of clarification in the midst of, uh, of your uh, uh, description there, you, you used the terms H1 and H3, and, and probably some people don't know what you're referring to. I'm hoping I know, but it doesn't matter. I'd like to, the answer anyway, just so people know what we're talking about. Sure, these are all type of um, uh, uh, influenza A strains, and I'm gonna have Zach answer um, uh, what we've actually studied with our monoclonal antibody in terms of uh, the different viruses uh, that it's effective against. Okay. So um, uh, maybe just to elaborate on what Donna has said, uh, H1 and H3 are the two uh, uh, most common subtypes of influenza A that are circulating in terms of seasonal uh, strains. And uh, H1, in fact, the H1 subtype um, uh, uh, was actually the, uh, the origin of the 2009 pandemic uh, virus as well. Uh, in terms of what we have uh, looked at, though, we have looked at a uh, variety of HAs that can broadly be grouped into either group one or group two uh, viruses. And this is based on their sequence identity to one another. And what we see is that the antibody VIS-410 is able to bind to and neutralize a wide variety 
of subtypes of flu in both the group one and group two influenza. Okay, and, and we are with H, we're referring to hemagglutinin, right? Correct. As, as yes. one of the yes. two principal antigens that uh, are, are make uh, influenza virus uh, are recognized by yes. the immune response. Yes, so the two, two of course, are hemagglutinin and neuraminidase, and that's commonly how uh, influenza A strains are identified by their uh, hemagglutinin subtype and their neuraminidase subtype. Now, one of the, one of the most characteristic features of, of the influenza virus is that it doesn't, it doesn't hold still. It keeps changing itself biochemically and uh, maybe you could say a bit more about what it is uh, or, or where along the hemagglutin and you've found a, uh, some, some biochemistry that's a little bit more stable than, than we usually think of, of, the, of that part of the, of the virus. Yeah, I think that's uh, really an important part of our presentation um, is uh, how did we identify the target uh, for a monoclonal antibody and then how did we go about um, designing the, the uh, monoclonal, and uh, how we identify the target uh, is important for vaccine strategy. Uh, it's a proprietary technology that uh, perhaps um, we could explain a little bit more, um, but essentially what's so powerful about this technology is you're able to look at a virus and find the spot that is unlikely uh, to uh, escape, uh, that a mutation is unlikely to occur at that spot because otherwise uh, the structure would fall apart. And so by targeting um, a spot that isn't going to uh, mutate, you therefore have a spot that your monoclonal antibody is likely to work for all upcoming um, strains. And of course, that also is the unique part of a potential vaccine candidate um, by this uh, area that we call um, on the stem um, that we've identified as a unique epitope that could be a universal vaccine candidate. So it's, it's a bit more of a buried structure, but it's still accessible to the antibody. Is that right? That, that is, is correct. That is yeah. correct. Yes. Okay, may, maybe, uh, although people, some people are familiar with monoclonal antibodies, maybe you could um, kind of take us through a few steps of how you produce the antibody in question and how it would be administered because it's not as straightforward. We're not talking about a vaccine that people would uh, get in the drugstore uh, or at their doctor's office uh, in, the, in the same way that the seasonal flu vaccine is now administered. This is some, somewhat of a more complicated uh, molecule to administer to individuals, either in a prophylactic or a, a, a therapeutic mode. So. Actually, it can be uh, administered in a quite simple way, and um, I guess there's an examples of that, which is monoclonal antibodies have really changed medicine since 1997. There's about 24, 25 that have been licensed. Only one infectious disease one, though. The rest have uh, been so important um, for uh, uh, inflammatory diseases, cancer, um, uh, have been major uh, game changers in the field. But there's been only one monoclonal antibody uh, for... Um, uh, uh, a virus, and that's RSV uh, synergis, uh, which is used and is available to give in a doctor's office uh, to prevent RSV for very high-risk infants. We envision this monoclonal antibody as being... Um, May maybe we, you should just say what RSV is for people so that it, it is a... A, a respiratory... A respiratory virus. Syncytial virus, RSV, that affects uh, mostly young uh, children uh, as well as uh, some other groups. Um, but that monoclonal antibody was one of the first licensed back in 1997. But since then, uh, no uh, monoclonals uh, have come forward. There's many in clinical trials um, for other uh, uh, viral uh, diseases. We think our technology is particularly well suited uh, for finding targets for monoclonal antibodies as we were describing uh, and in infectious disease because we can find targets that the virus would not be able to escape from. And then the other important part is how we're designing these antibodies. We're not depending on the usual ways of uh, screening or panning uh, or using transgenic mice. This is a completely novel way of making an antibody by engineering. Uh, we're hopeful that this um, uh, 
approach will give us something uh, that hasn't been shown before that's so avid uh, our monoclonal antibody at the peak of molar uh, level uh, and also to this unique target. Okay, can, can you, you say that the, your, your approach to producing the antibody is proprietary, but why don't, can you share with us some of the steps involved that, uh, that you, don't, you don't keep? Yeah, a absolutely. Um, <coughs> and, uh, and, and so what, uh, what we do and what will actually be discussed in the presentation is the fact that, um, as Donna has said, um, we take a uh, structure-based approach uh, to look at and identify so-called uh, conserved targets on, in this case, influenza HA. Having identified such a target, uh, what we do um, is we use the same underlying structure-based approach uh, to, uh, to engineer an antibody scaffold to bind with high, high affinity and specificity towards that target. Um, and the idea there is uh, to identify portions of, in this case, an antibody that can be changed uh, to engineer in those high affinity contacts and portions of the antibody that can't be changed for structural reasons. Uh, and using an iterative approach between uh, computer and silico-based design and experiment, we arrive at an antibody like Vis410 that demonstrates desirable uh, therapeutic properties. Um, and so this is in contrast and, and uh, to, to uh, many existing approaches that have identified broadly neutralizing antibodies for infectious disease, which primarily rely on uh, taking a patient or a vaccinated individual's B cells and panning for uh, antibodies that have desired properties. And we feel that the approach is very complementary um, and in the case of uh, a vaccine approach, directly demonstrates that the epitope that we're targeting has, has potential uh, in terms of uh, vaccine-based strategies. Now, when you test this antibody, this monoclonal antibody in mice, how do you administer it to the mice? Uh, typically, we have uh, uh, given the antibody uh, via IP injection to the interperitoneal uh, uh, injection. In patients, uh, though, um, we're expecting that we can give this in two different ways, um, both intramuscularly, um, just a shot, um, or intravenously uh, for perhaps the sickest patients when you're treating them in the hospital. And in terms of timing uh, of, of when you would give the, this treatment to, to patients, your well, maybe you can extrapolate from your from your experiments with mice to give us some idea of how that would... Yeah, I think it's an imp you know, important consideration, which is how would we use this antibody and uh, where is it um, most important? And uh, we sort of see it in two ways. You, you know, um, part of the problem with the pandemic situation is when a pandemic occurs, the vaccines that are prepared aren't the ones that are going to work that season. Uh, and therefore you're stuck um, with um, potential high mortality, um, something that we've seen recently. Um, so the approach for having a monoclonal antibody as a critical medicine would be that you could stockpile that antibody if you had an antibody that would work like we view ours uh, to any strain that would come forward. And you would then use that antibody in a containment strategy, perhaps for first responders, hospitalized patients, um, in ring containment. So as part of protecting uh, an area and containing the spread of a pandemic, the um, monoclonal antibody would be given to people before uh, they become ill as a prevention. Uh, once patients were already ill, uh, you'd obviously like to treat patients uh, as soon as they become ill. And in fact, uh, you would then figure out which patients would most benefit from your therapy. Uh, there are some drugs now for flu. Um, at, but they have to be administered within 48 hours uh, of patients having symptoms. And in fact, they only give moderate benefit uh, from patients uh, to patients. And thus, the idea is to have a new therapy, a monoclonal antibody. We would have to compare, of course, in clinical studies to see if um, the, the uh, antibody approach would actually be more effective. Okay, but how does it stack in the mice? How does it stack up compared to a a small mole molecule antiviral agent that only works so-so uh, in terms of alleviating the, 
the symptoms, the worst symptoms of a flu attack or a flu infection? Yes, the, um, um, of course, models, animal models only go so far. Right, right. Um, and in fact, you can um, create models that uh, you can, um, uh, for these viruses, depending on which ones you use, that you can rescue them with the present drugs, even though the present drugs um, don't, in fact, in the field, uh, give patients complete benefit. So with that said, our monoclonal antibody um, compared to Tamiflu, uh, we uh, it was one such study that we aren't presenting today because it's just complete this week. Um, but in that model against a very um, pathogenic virus, H5, our monoclonal antibody offered more protection and for prevention and also worked better as a treatment uh, than a high dose of the uh, um, standard drug. Okay, and, and I just noted, note that you said H5, so that even though your monoclonal was aimed at more at H1 and H3, it still extends more broadly to protect, oh, yes. in this case, against H5. Oh yes, the neutralization data that we'll show um, is for all of um, the H1, we, I guess you can list them. Yeah, all of the, uh, uh, so, so it includes both group one and group two uh, viruses. So H1, H5, uh, we include binding data on H2, also H3, H7. So the idea is that this is a pan-influenza A. It really does and, and, hold up to, yes, that, to, to yes. that criteria. Okay. Um, well, I have a question I see from the Internet. Jim, if you would share it with us. Uh, yes. Uh, this question is from uh, Helen Branswell of the Canadian Press. Uh, she wants to know, can this monoclonal antibody be produced and marketed cheaply enough to be useful in flu prevention and treatment? So I think I understood the question it was about cost. Is that correct? Cost and yeah. volume of production, I guess. Yes. yes. Well, um, uh, you know, for any monoclonal antibody, or actually for any new drug, cost is important. And I think uh, all I could say to that is, uh, uh, as we increase the yield uh, and uh, have better and better ways of making monoclonal antibodies, the costs are coming down. Uh, and we're hopeful that the dose that would actually be necessary uh, would, uh, in fact, be cost effective. But cost effectiveness will be part of the clinical trial designs um, to see that. The second question was, could you produce enough um, to give, um, in the middle of a pandemic, uh, antibody to everybody in the world? Um, I think not. Um, uh, but what our strategy would be uh, is to have uh, enough antibody to use in the um, ways that I had discussed in targeted ways to help um, uh, contain a, a pandemic. I did want to ask, when you, when you mentioned stockpiling, what kind of shelf, I was going to ask what kind of shelf life you're talking about, how long you can store. Yes, monoclonal antibodies have a benefit there. Um, uh, some have been stored for quite a long time, years and years and years. Um, standardly, it's a couple of years. Um, uh, uh, two years, uh, but in fact, there are formulations that could be longer than that uh, for this unique situation. All right. No, uh, there, there's another question nagging at me, but I, I'm, I'm still haven't quite framed it yet. But yesterday, we heard from a, a Canadian uh, a researcher talking about how uh, the. the a number of, well, she was talking about ferret experiments where animals had been vaccinated with a seasonal flu vaccine and then were exposed to H1N1, the, the, the new pandemic influenza, and, and their, their experience of disease was worsened by that prior exposure. Is there any kind of concern here that, that, would, that comes from that result, that odd result of exposure to one type of, of influenza vaccine makes the experience with another type worse instead of better. Yeah, I, I um, um, think that was an odd result. Um, uh, but for us, for a monoclonal antibody, it's probably not relevant uh, in that was a vaccine response. And when you have a vaccine, there's many things that you're responding to. In fact, it is your antibody response that's measured each year to figure out if the vaccines are effective. Um, that's what one uses as the tool to determine if a vaccine's going to work. 
So I don't expect that that should be an issue um, for our monoclonal antibody, which neutralizes the virus, the mechanism being uh, it keeps the virus um, uh, from, uh, I guess I should let you explain that. Uh, keeps, uh, so we've done a number of mechanistic studies, so it keeps the uh, virus from being able to fuse with the host cell. Um, so there's a very direct antiviral effect. Okay, good. We have a question from someone in the room. Please. Two Hi, um, Marin McKenna from Wired. Um, have you gotten to the point yet where you can start to think about the practical realities of licensing something like this? And I ask that thinking of the FDA's difficulty of ever coming to grips with licensure for dose-sparing strategies such as adjuvants. Um, I think you were asking about our licensing strategy. I'm actually quite experienced at bringing monoclonal antibodies forward, um, and from my previous experience have done that often. Um, and our expectations are that this monoclonal antibody, uh, we have already started manufacturing uh, and expect to be in the clinics, um, uh, in the clinical stage by 2014. Uh, and don't really see any major roadblocks, but of course you have to complete all of those studies that are so-called IND enabling, uh, which is some additional toxicology uh, and uh, other testing uh, that's required. Um, but we don't really see roadblocks going forward uh, and I hope to get to patients pretty quickly. I think there was a, there's another question in the room, uh, Jim. Hi, Dan Keller, Medscape. Um, if I understood you right, right, this conserved epitope is somehow hidden. Is that um, normally not? Uh, it, did I hear that right? It's normally not um, visible. And if that's so, first correct me if I'm wrong, because then I won't go on this path. Um, how is it recognized by the monoclonals? Is it transiently um, somehow revealed? And if so, why isn't the body already making a response to this in normal uh, flu infections? And can you use this epitope as a vaccine and essentially put yourself out of business? And how often would you have to boost the response? Um, would one shot do people forever? <laughs> well, I think... Um your question's a good one, actually, uh, about, uh, so what about this epitope, and is it normally exposed? The answer is yes. Um, and why isn't the immune system um, for this uh, epitope, as well as some of the other epitopes that have been identified uh, as potential university can uh, universal candidates, uh, why isn't uh, the immune system responding and protecting us already? Um, we don't have a good answer to that, uh, why it isn't. Um, um, and, uh, but it's pretty clear that humans can make antibodies to these epitopes on the stem. Um, and I, it uh, is a complicated answer to explain, uh, complicated because I think we don't understand why uh, individuals don't normally, uh, if you will, make enough antibody to protect from every strain that might be out there. Um, but there's a lot of hand-waving about why that could be, and then part of that hand-waving is to figure out how you t take this epitope and actually make it immunogenic um, to ultimately serve as a vaccine. And those will be the studies that will have to be done now uh, as we've identified this region as a region, uh, as, a, uh, as a candidate for a universal um, vaccine. But as you can tell, we're, we're focused on the monoclonal antibody, um, and that's more direct, uh, is actually providing the antibody to the patients uh, and don't have to, in that way, uh, worry about that question. Are there any studies at this point to see if the monoclonal is putting selective pressure on to make this conserved epitope not so conserved? Yes, that's a, a good one. Um, and um, I think Zach can tell you the experiments we've done to show that we feel that it is conserved. So, um, uh, thanks, Donna. So, uh, in fact, we have uh, completed a set of studies and we are continuing to uh, look at this because it is a very important question. Um, and to date, uh, we, we do not see uh, escape mutations that are generated. Obviously, that's a negative, uh, which can't be proven, um, but we are continuing to look at this. We think we have um, a structural explanation for why this epitope is conserved that be go goes beyond just a, a regular sequence uh, conservation argument. Uh, but we continue to look at this both in in vitro selective uh, uh, pressure types of experiments as well as in vivo. Uh, 
kind of in, in a corollary to that question, and we have another question coming from the internet in a minute. It, do, you, do you envision continuing to tinker with and optimize the monoclonal antibody that you now have, or is it, is it already optimized? Uh, I mean, some of that tinkering might, might be necessary if there is some slow escape from, from uh, the binding. Well, we, we think we've done our tinkering, um, and that's why um, we've got a lead candidate that's so highly avid uh, at the peak and molar level, and therefore we think this is the candidate that will go to patients. Of course, one um, um, can find things along the way that one doesn't expect and, uh, and then, uh, then change, but I think this will be the uh, actual monoclonal that's uh, taken to the clinics. Okay. Uh, Jim, you have another question there. Uh, yes, this question, once again, is from uh, Helen Branswell of the Canadian Press. Uh, she wants to know, uh, so do you see this monoclonal antibody as being used primarily in a pandemic setting and not for uncomplicated seasonal flu? No, we're looking at um, both uh, indications uh, for this product. Uh, uh, I think the pandemic uh, is, is one of the obvious, uh, uh, most pressing needs for a monoclonal antibody. Uh, because of the public health urgency. Um, but we will, in our clinical development plan, also study it for seasonal flu, um, for patients that are, um, if you will, with routine flu, uh, as well as targeting uh, the patients, perhaps, uh, that are those most affected uh, and have the most serious outcome from flu, so-called high-risk patients. And that's what we're now developing in our clinical strategy. And what would there... Is there any group of people who are not, let's say, eligible for the vaccine who would, who might be treated by this, or, or would they also be ruled out because this wouldn't jibe with their immune systems or whatever other medical problems they might have? Well, there's two answers to that. Of course, we don't get the vaccine to everybody, um, uh, uh, even though we've got universal recommendations here in the United States. Um, but with that said, um, also, the vaccine doesn't work as well in certain high-risk groups, those that are uh, immunocompromised, those that are um, elderly, and thus those are targeted populations that may well benefit um, from having an antibody besides the group that just doesn't get immunized. Okay. I see we have another question in the room. What are you testing in the mice? Is this a mouse antibody or a humanized antibody? So do you have mouse anti-human, or will you get human anti-mouse, or will you have a fully humanized antibody to use in humans? So this is a fully human antibody designed in a very novel way, but a fully human antibody. And thus, um, uh, the antibodies now that are given to people that are fully human haven't really engendered uh, problems with uh, anti-human antibody. Uh, the earlier um, forms did that had more mouse parts to them, um, but the newer generation of fully human antibodies uh, have uh, had terrific safety profiles and um, half-lives, and thus this is such uh, a fully human antibody. And to answer your question, it was the fully human antibody that was te tested in mice, um, but because it's a anti human antibody in mice, it actually has a shorter half-life in mice than it would in humans. But it doesn't make the mice sick from it, the antibody. They don't develop an allergic response or some other sort of Im immune response that would undermine it, the effectiveness beyond yeah. the short term? In the short term, one doesn't um, see those uh, uh, anti-human uh, antibodies. In the longer term, you could in these mouse models. Um, but uh, the answer is it didn't cause problems, if you will. It protected them, um, made them survive, gain weight. Um, so there wasn't any um, obvious toxicity. Okay, are there other questions? Do you, do you have any final comments either of you would like to make? Um, uh, so I guess uh, I, I would say um, maybe two things in, in closing. Uh, one is that, uh, uh, and, and potentially just to uh, expand on the, the uh, gentleman's comment down here, uh, we believe the uh, technology, uh, the underlying technology that uh, has, has been used at Vistera um, uh, certainly is, uh, we are quite excited about Viz 410 
as a product opportunity. And uh, we think in the context of whether that extends to uh, vaccine approaches or uh, effective therapeutics for other infectious diseases, those are things we are, are looking very carefully at. And we think the approach we use here is uh, uh, potentially complementary to existing approaches and also can answer some questions we believe that uh, have confounded uh, the field in, in the past. But uh, that remains to be seen. Okay, so well, we do have a, another question, it sounds like, right? Sorry. Yes, uh, actually, we're going to go ahead and make this the last question. Okay. Um, this is, once again, from uh, Helen Branswell uh, at the Canadian Press. She wants to know, does Vis Vistera have development funding from BARDA, and is Vistera in talks with BARDA about adding this monoclonal antibody to the U.S. stockpile? I think it's too soon for those discussions with BARDA, um, and the answer is no, we don't have funding um, from BARDA, um, uh, and, uh, but that might be a future um, uh, approach. Okay, so uh, just to remind our viewers, I, I've been talking with Zachary Shriver and Donna Ambrosino of Vistera, which is located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. That's the end of our first uh, session for today. We have several more lined up, including a big expansive uh, session at 2 o'clock uh, Pacific Coast time this afternoon. Uh, so uh, that, that's this week in microbiology or something. Uh, thanks for joining us. No, I got it wrong. Well, something like that. Join us anyway at, at uh, noon and uh, 1 p.m. and 2 p.m. Thanks for Thanks for being with us. Explore the fundamental role of microbes in the natural history of our planet with Microbes in Evolution, the world that Darwin never saw. Available at eStore.asm.org.